the Tuesday, October 11, 2022 morning work session of the Portland City Council. Uh, today's subject is clean energy. We're here along with some very, very important guests who've come all the way from Denmark, as well as a number of Portland's representatives in our delegation to learn about best practices from a country that I think we all acknowledge has made significant progress in the clean industry sector. Indeed, I would go so far as to say is recognized as the global leader in this sector. Learning from our international peers is an important step in supporting Portland companies to be globally competitive while also meeting our aggressive climate goals. Our manufacturing companies, of course, play a pivotal role in our economy. They provide good middle-wage jobs and they're responsible for over 70% of our region's exports. I'm excited about the tremendous opportunity we have here today to tap into their knowledge about the growing clean energy sector and at the same time being successful at decarbonizing their operations. 
And I want to thank Commissioner Rubio for leading this work session today. Without further ado, I'll turn it over to her and I'll figure out my technology. Thank you, Mayor. Uh, we're here today because we all believe that climate change requires accelerated, aggressive action, and that every sector of our economy and how we live as individuals must shift and must change. And we all want less carbon, clean air, cleaner water, and some a more sustainable future for our children and future generations. And agreeing on the big picture today is easy, but action is harder and even harder for our industrial sector as it aims to transition to decarbonized, circular, and cleaner production practices. So we went looking for answers because this isn't just our struggle. Countries and companies and communities around the world are seeking solutions. And so our work started with the work group convened by my office. And in that space, we brought together a cross-section of individuals from within government, business, large institutions, and community organizations. And out of that space came a concept of a clean industry hub, which was supported by this council and is in progress. In the interim, and to keep the collaborative conversations moving forward, we had the good fortune to be introduced by my, uh, my office to be introduced to the Center of Sustainable Infrastructure by leaders in the business and sustainability community. Reese Roth is with us today and gets tremendous credit and appreciation for putting together our initial knowledge exchange that included a trip to Denmark to learn how they are transitioning to the industrial, uh, in their industrial sector. And this experience was invaluable. All of us who do policy development work know that talking about potential solutions is one thing, but actually seeing them in practice, in action, and seeing what is possible is an entirely different thing. And in addition, having that experience shared with a diverse set of stakeholders made it even better in our conversations and uh, dreaming richer. All levels of the Danish government and the private sector are proving that economic growth and saving our planet can be achieved together through mutual collaboration and shared goals. Not only does Denmark see opportunity, but this work is also the basis for the country's carbon reduction plan. And even though there are historical, demographic, and political differences between our two countries, there is a uniting force behind this way forward, and our region has a similar opportunity. It would have been very challenging for any one of us to communicate effectively about what we saw on our trip, especially to the business and large institutions needing and wanting to shift their practices. So that's why we're here today with the subset of our delegation to continue our knowledge exchange. Our Danish friends will share with you a bit of what we saw in Denmark, and they are also taking the time to speak directly with businesses and do some industrial site assessments. Now I will hand it over to representatives from Prosper to provide the landscape of the industrial sector in Portland to ground us in this discussion. Good morning, and uh, buenos dias, mayor and commissioners, for the record. My name is Shay Flaherty Bethin, and I'm the Economic Development Director at Prosper Portland. I'm excited to give you all an overview of Portland's manufacturing strengths, challenges, and opportunities, as well as how Prosper Portland engages within this sector, especially as it relates to our friends and guests here today. Let's see. As you are aware, we are working with RW Ventures on the city's next inclusive economic development strategy that centers racial equity and climate. Recently, our consultants completed a cluster analysis that included sectors important to our conversation today, such as metals and machinery and green cities, which includes products and services in areas like climate tech, green building, clean energy, etc. Those two sectors provide quality jobs and pay well above the average for our region. Black and brown Portlanders and women are underrepresented in both, so increasing diversity within these clusters is important due to the prevalence of competitive salary jobs that don't require a bachelor's degree. Portland manufacturers face a number of challenges. As you'll see in a moment, our lack of industrial land supply limits expansion opportunities, impacting the growth of good middle wage jobs. Retaining and attracting workers is one of the top challenges facing the industry. Nearly one fourth of manufacturing workers are age 55 or older. Portland is also a global brand and Portland manufacturers represent 70% of our city's exports. We need to ensure that these manufacturers stay competitive in a global economy amidst supply chain disruptions and other economic impacts. Investing in innovation, 
particularly in ways to decarbonize their operations, will be crucial to responding to consumer demands for low embodied carbon products. With the recent Inflation Reduction Act, or IRA, we have just witnessed the most significant industrial policy legislation signed into law in decades, incentivizing investment into manufacturing towards a clean economy. If we do not partner with manufacturers now to address their challenges, we actually lose the chance to capture these new investments from the IRA and grow middle wage employment. Earlier this year, our colleagues in the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability updated the city's economic opportunity analysis, or the EOA, for the 2035 comprehensive plan. The update lays out land availability by land use type and job growth by wage type. So as you can see here, the city has ample land availability for low wage and high wage jobs, but is limited in land that creates and sustains a higher proportion of middle wage jobs. So we can look at this a different way. Um, and we can see that industrial and mixed employment land use types, so those that we just saw are most at risk, have a higher proportion of middle wage jobs. On the other hand, we have ample land supply for jobs that are on the very low and very high end of the wage spectrum. So you can think of this collectively as furthering a dynamic of wage disparity in our city. Finally, our BPS colleagues explored what types of job growth increase the incomes of black and brown Portlanders and thus reduce the region's wide racial income disparity. This chart that you see here is based on the region's distribution of jobs by sector, race, education, and wage. You'll see it's primarily industrial and some office jobs that actually raise black and other POC incomes relative to the rest of our broader economy. While industrial jobs also raise incomes across the board for everyone, their larger effect is in raising black incomes by 25% and other BIPOC incomes by 20% relative to other job types combined. In contrast, job growth in retail and consumer services reduced BIPOC incomes by 28% relative to the other sectors, and healthcare and education reduced those incomes by 8%. So the key takeaway here is that our, our growth in Portland, our faster job growth in healthcare, education, and consumer services are actually over time reducing black and BIPOC incomes relative to their job growth in other parts of our economy. So within Prosper Portland, our Economic Development Department's business advancement team helps growing businesses by identifying opportunities and providing support so that those companies can create living wage jobs and equitable economic growth. The business advances team, we have a suite of programs and referrals for basically three key areas, business competitiveness, inclusive job creation, and equitable economic growth. The team leads partnerships and initiatives that advance equitable economic growth with a focus on four industry clusters that are most competitive in our region, our Portland Means Progress initiative is housed within this team, and that program leverages relationships with the business community to advance racial equity outcomes. Our financial incentive programs, like the Enterprise Zone or the Inspire and Diversity Grant, require that companies that are joining Portland Means Progress have to report on culture change, intentional hiring, or diverse procurement on an annual basis. The team is also partnering with our local BIPOC chambers and the port to center diverse companies in our international trade activities. So within the new inclusive economic development strategy, we're reviewing these four priority clusters overall, and you can look forward to a draft of that strategy later this year. So here's a brief example of how the team works. Our cluster liaison connects with a metals fabricator who wants to expand or improve. They may offer assistance around site selection in different ways via partners like the Port of Portland or via our own ability to look for brokerage uh, sites in our brokerage database. So while looking at sites, we can also identify what incentives they may qualify for, like the Enterprise Zone or specific programs in TIF districts. We also work with Prosper Portland's lending team and with Business Oregon to identify loan products that could address the company's capital needs. And we serve as a referral partner to energy efficiency programs such as the Energy Trust of Oregon for fleet electrification or a property fit, which is a program that's a financial tool for seismic upgrades and energy efficiency. And finally, to aid manufacturers in being more competitive, we partner with the Oregon Manufacturing Extension Partnership, which offers matching grants for manufacturers, and we bring on lean manufacturing consultants that help the company achieve those efficiencies. So uh, looking ahead, there are some exciting opportunities for this sector. Based on local interviews, national and local data analysis, RW Ventures are looking at strategies such as the five that you see on screen here. The first three of the five really connect around this concept of the clean industry economy, whether it's materials innovations, reducing emissions, or supplying the clean energy sector. The second two, the final two, are really around increasing opportunities for BIPOC community participation, such as BIPOC-focused training and continuing support for diverse businesses that are both supplying and running manufacturing operations. 
For example, we recently awarded an Inspiring Diversity grant to a BIPOC-owned metals fabricator for their own training program. So I think uh, as we move forward, we're really trying to continue to find and support opportunities that are at this intersection of both industry and regeneration. So finally, I wanna thank all the partners and stakeholders who joined us on the Portland Clean Energy Delegation to Denmark. I wanna thank Commissioner Rubio for her leadership and to the host committee for organizing all the events this week. And uh, thank you to our own cluster liaisons, Catherine Kroniak, Kevin Johnson, and their manager, Pam Neal, without whom our work would not be possible. Lastly, later in this session, uh, you will hear from some of the participants in our delegation, but I believe that now Commissioner Rubio will introduce our new Danish colleagues who will give you an overview of clean industry efforts in Denmark. Thank you so much, Shay, for that presentation, and thank you for joining us in, in Denmark as well. It was really important to have Prosper represented. Next, it's my honor to welcome and introduce uh, to you three leaders recognized for their innovation in this field, uh, Meta, Wendell, Per Moller, both from Kalemborg Symbiosis, and Klaus Ekman, energy attache for the Consulate General of Denmark based in Silicon Valley. So we're very honored uh, to have you here today. Um, and so we will turn it over to you. Thank you very much. And uh, I want to thank all of you for the warm welcome and for the possibility for us for, to come here and, uh, and talk about uh, what we're doing, I think, as has already been stressed, international collaboration is absolutely necessary at this point in history. We need to uh, get our brains together and see what we can do, and, uh, and we're happy to participate uh, in, the, in the work we're doing with you. Uh, I'm positioned in, uh, in California. We have a lot of good collaboration with, uh, with your Californian neighbors, and we're hoping to expand uh, our collaboration with a lot of stakeholders here on the West Coast. And I'm, again, very pleased to be here. Now, one global problem, I think, is, is IT, and <laughs> I haven't been able to get my PowerPoint up here, so you'll have to live with my PDF version, which means that some of the slides will be uh, a bit busy, but uh, I think we'll, we'll manage. Um, yeah, it's, well, working. <clears throat> it's working. Okay. I was told to uh, give a brief 10 minutes introduction to uh, the green transition in Denmark and how we think of this. I hope to be able to bring in a, a few perspectives uh, during the, the next 10 minutes, so... <clears throat> oh, okay. So I don't want to bore you with all the, the statistics. Denmark, as you know, is a small uh, country, about 6 million people in the southern part of, uh, of Northern Europe, uh, in between uh, Germany, Sweden, Norway, and the UK. And I think we'll just move on. Uh, okay, so here's the busy slide. <laughs> um, so this is a, a slide that shows, the graph shows the uh, energy consumption in Denmark over time over the last uh, 120 years. Uh, and, I, and I wanted to point out three periods in time that has been uh, very important for our green transition. The first was the oil crisis in the 70s. And as you can see here, it had the effect that uh, our rapid increase in energy consumption kind of stopped at that point. Uh, we uh, focused a lot on uh, energy savings. Uh, there was a picture there of a small child running in the streets. We actually had car-free Sundays uh, in periods during the 70s. And uh, in this period, we learned to save energy, but also to think uh, different sectors together. So we had at that point uh, the power production from oil, we had uh, heating of our homes with oil, and then we started to build uh, combined heat and power plants and build, our, uh, build out our district heating networks, thereby saving enormous amounts of energy and CO2 emissions by thinking the sectors together and using the excess heat from the, from the power production in our, uh, the heating of our homes. The next period, I think, came uh, after the Brundtland uh, report in, 90, uh, in 89. During the 90s, there was uh, what I would call a, a new, renewed focus on, uh, on climate issues, uh, and we started to introduce CO2 taxes and so on. You can also see it there on the graph that uh, coal is partly phased out, and we start to have a lot of renewable energy in the system. And then the last period I want to focus on was the, what I call the green acceleration after the, the COP uh, 
meeting in, uh, in Paris. Uh, you can see that the graph is really taking, uh, taking speed. Renewable energy is now uh, more than 50% of our energy consumption. You can see also see the, the rapid uh, decline of, of the use of fossil fuels. Um, of course, this also plays into uh, the basic numbers of uh, greenhouse gas emissions, reduction of uh, 50% since 1990. Uh, and uh, this is during a period where we had a, a reasonable economic growth at the same time. So we kind of proved that you can actually decouple uh, greenhouse gas emission and economic growth. Yeah, and, and so what are the drivers for this? And, and of course, it's a, it's a very uh, big and complicated picture, and I just want to highlight three drivers for this, uh, this development. One thing, as I mentioned already, is the efficiency and system thinking. I think Pierre will also uh, talk more about this. Uh, just a picture here of the only cement production facility we have in Denmark, the, one of the largest factories we have in the country. And, and what they did is to install uh, heat exchangers, getting the, the excess heat from the ovens out in the community as district heating and uh, providing cheaper uh, heat for the, for the community around the factory. So that's, that's one way of thinking industry and, uh, and heating sector together. Uh, another uh, aspect is the, what I would call the multi-stranded regulation. Uh, acknowledging that one type of re regulation is typically not enough. I don't know if this um, picture gets a bit complicated. It's, it's an attempt to, to say, okay, what kind of technology to, technologies do we have implemented in our, in our system? We have uh, a few black, uh, what I would call black technologies, we have the green technologies, and we have like a, a spectrum in between. So the different policies can uh, pull in this distribution in different ways. We have on the, on the green side, research and development, uh, subsidies for immature uh, technologies to kind of boost uh, this part of the spectrum. On the other side of the spectrum, we have uh, codes and standards that kind of chop off the tail of this distribution. And then we use the standard uh, economic incentives, tax and tax credits and so on to kind of push uh, the use of, of more and more uh, of greener and greener technologies. So it's a good mix of different kinds of regulation that brought us uh, all the way uh, to where we are today. And finally, I also want to highlight uh, the, the shared goals and the uh, collaboration we have in the country. Uh, if you look back over the last 20 years, all the big climate and energy bills were made with a, a vast majority of the parties in the parliament. You know, we have like seven, eight different parties in the parliament. And, and I think there's a, a common understanding that if we want to go, uh, if we want to reach our climate goals, uh, we need to work together and we don't want to have a bill that's passed by part of the, uh, of the parliament, then the government change and we'll have a new direction. So it's extremely important for the businesses and also for, 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 uh, for uh, normal people to, to have the security and know that the, the overall lines are set. Uh, we also have strong collaboration with uh, the industry and, and, uh, and with uh, normal citizens, and there are two examples that were launched here over the last couple of years, uh, the, what we call the climate partnerships with industry, and also uh, what I would highlight here, the citizen assembly, so a special assembly of, of citizens that are put together to, to uh, inform the, the politicians and, uh, and get a common uh, and collaborative effort. So the partnerships were created by the present uh, Danish government. It's four, 14 public-private partnerships uh, where, uh, so, the, so the basic idea is the different industries, they know uh, the best way. It's not the experts in the government or the bureaucracy. Uh, so we formed these uh, partnerships and got a lot of input from the different, uh, different uh, industries, also taking into account, of course, the competitiveness, the export, jobs and welfare and so on. Yeah, I don't want to go into detail, but these are the different, uh, the 14 different partnerships. And just one example, I know the slide here is in, in Danish, but it's just to illustrate what kind of work come out of, of these, uh, these partnerships. And this is uh, an example from the Partnership for Energy Intensive Industries. So the, the overall goal uh, of Denmark is to uh, reduce the greenhouse gas emissions by 70% uh, in 2030 uh, compared to 1990. 
and uh, the task that these different cli uh, climate partnerships were given is to contribute with their fair share of this reduction goal. And they came up with graphs like this. So we have the, the uh, emission in 1990, and then they actually pointed out a number of very concrete uh, initiatives where, that could bring their part of the of the greenhouse gas emissions down to to the 30% in 2030. Uh, I'm not saying that all these will be picked up by the politicians, but it has been an, an amazing inspiration and a very big source of uh, of knowledge and analysis that we can build our uh, our policies on. And I think I'm running out of time. Uh, just uh, I think this one is also interesting. In order to get uh, get input from normal citizens, we, we, we created this assembly. Uh, 99 citizens were picked randomly, uh, of course, taking into account uh, the representation. So we have people from the cities, from the rural areas, different ages, different incomes. And, uh, and they actually, uh, at this point, already have made two big reports to the politicians with a number of, uh, of initiatives and ideas for how to, how to move on. And I think it's, it's a way to strengthen our democracy and get input from, uh, from, from uh, what I would call normal people. The way forward, this is the greenhouse gas emissions uh, in development from 1990 up to today, and then the forecast uh, with the solid line up to uh, 2035. The, the blue line in 2030 is to our goal of 70% reduction. Of course, there's a long way to go. We need a lot of input from uh, you guys, from uh, all the different stakeholders, both, both back in Denmark and, and internationally. And, uh, it's going to be, it's a tough way forward, but I'm, I'm pretty confident we'll make it and, uh, and actually we, we will also, uh, at the end of the day, be happy that we did it because it creates a lot of jobs, it cre creates a lot of welfare, and as you know, Denmark is a very uh, low country, a lot of, of the land is actually just a few meters uh, above sea level, so this is also a, a sec securing our future. I think that's it. Yeah, thank you. Just a minute. So, we from the Kalambor Symbiosis, Pierre Müller and I, we are very pleased to be here in Portland as we were to welcome all of you in Denmark, the Danish delegation. And uh, after having Klaus' very fine introduction to the Denmark and Danish conditions for cooperation on green transition, uh, Pierre and I will continue with the presentation of our facilitating organization, the Kalambor Symbiosis. The Kalambor Symbiosis is located in a smaller town in Denmark. However, Kalambor is a big industrial cluster with, a, with several world-leading companies and the companies have formed a partnership and a co collaboration uh, on surplus and circular production. We have a short video which introduces the concepts in a very good way. Hopefully it would work, otherwise I think I have some help. Yeah. And we'll see. There's no sound on it. Yes. Yeah, I stop sharing and you try to share. Otherwise, we can speak, speak. it. Yeah. 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 And it's always the fun of having these kind of meetings. May I just add that normally what we say when we work with the uh, synergies, industrial symbiosis, is that technology makes it possible, but people make it happen, right? Well so we hope. Yeah. Oh, God. Okay. 
In a windy corner of West Zealand, in Denmark, lies the city of Kalenborg. It's here an industrial symbiosis has shared the surplus of excess resources for more than 50 years. Our planet needs new solutions. We must transform our production to thrive in the 21st century. That's why Kalenborg aims to be the world's leading industrial symbiosis. By symbiosis, we understand a partnership where our partners provide, share, and reuse resources. As public and private companies are physically connected, one company's surplus of resources adds value to another. Kalenborg's global companies collaborate with local businesses and authorities across sectors to solve some of the biggest challenges we are facing today. Large industrial companies share excess energy, water, and materials, so less goes to waste. Today, more than 20 different streams of resources flow between the companies. Every year, our efforts reduce thousands of tons of CO2 emissions, and we are aiming for full resource utilization and zero waste within the next decades. The symbiosis model also creates the trust and power of innovation within the community. For the employees involved, for students and for researchers. We are proud that our model already inspires people from other countries. But we would like to spread it further. Nothing is more evolving than new partners eager to experiment, innovate and share with us. In Kalenborg symbiosis, sustainability, growth and profit go hand in hand. That is what we believe should be the new normal. But most of all, we hope our local efforts can be an example of best practice and are multiplied in similar symbioses around the globe, demonstrating local solutions to our global challenges. Thank you. Yeah, I think the last bit of the video shows why we are here, because we would like to share our knowledge with all of the world. And um, yeah, we can just continue on the screen. Um, I would like to unfold uh, the concept of symbiosis or industrial symbiosis a little bit more, because the concept symbiosis is borrowed from the world of biology, where it describes a relationship between uh, different species where they both um, they both um, gain from their cohabitation, like the flower and the bees. And uh, this concept is an appropriate analogy for the special environment that exists in Kalambor, where 14 very different public and private partners are cooperating to promote common values, both economically and environmentally. And we, when we say symbiosis, the concept to us means the partnership, the cooperation, but it also means the mindset of sharing the resources and establishing surplus and synergetic. And it's the room for everybody, the human perspective, the cooperation and synergetic make room for a way of doing business that provides room for equity and inclusion. So what are the gains and benefits? The companies gain money and reduce their climate footprint, for instance, their greenhouse gas emission. The public partners benefit, benefit from the partnership by being able to establish stronger and more resilient policy work with strong dedication and support from the private partners. By including not only the public, but also the private stakeholders, it will support the strategic work and ensure the implementation of green changes. And finally, it will benefit the society. The people living in the society will gain good jobs and um, green transition uh, will give, as we have heard already from um, Prosper, will uh, give a very large amount of uh, well-paid, qualified jobs. And, um, and uh, 
this will uh, benefit all of the society. And um, would you please bring it a slide further? Perhaps I should have started here, but it, this is the Calumbo Symbiosis uh, Secretariat. We um, are the secretariat of this association between the 14 um, companies in the associ association, and um, we work to facilitate their board of directors. Uh, Pierre will tell you a lot more. Will tell you a lot more about that, and our values. Uh, I think it's important to mention is uh, trust, confidentiality, equality, and cooperation. And then I'll leave it to you, Pierre. Thank you. Next slide, please. And before I start talking, I apologize for my absence when you came to Denmark. Yeah, Corona hit me, uh, but I'm so happy it makes it even more special to be here today. So. Um, Yes, what I would like to uh, go into is actually just to show you a little bit more detail into how we actually then collaborate. What is it we do that is so special and really just normal, the new normal? So what you see here is the, is the uh, is, is, is a photo of the, this very small area of this very small city. I would even call it a town with 17,000 inhabitants and a municipality of 50,000. So if you could just press next because then we will see the... Uh, the, uh, the outline of the businesses. So next, yeah, uh, yeah, we didn't see that anyway. But this is just to say that uh, this is a very small area, uh, and of course proximity is important. But it's not uh, a strong limiting factor. So uh, the latest development that we have seen is that we are actually now looking into mega products where we can do a lot of good, create a lot of value by actually thinking a much broader geographic area into it. And then that's really where we hit the circular agenda, the way we can actually create value beyond our own local society. So what you see here is uh, the realized industrial synergies. Uh, it's spread into three categories. So we work intensively within water because we are realizing water stress, believe it or not. It was never the case in Denmark, but it's happening with the climate change that we see now, extreme weather conditions. And of course, a growing, a strong industry that needs water, water of high qualities. We work with uh, energy at multiple levels, and we work with uh, materials also. It's not as simple as that, because water contains the, the capacity of cooling. It also in, contains energy to heat. It also contains or, organic solvents sometimes, organic uh, compounds to produce biogas. So it's a complex thing. So it's a multifunctional issue this way. So we need to look at our resources as resources, uh, waste as potential resources, and we need to understand the complexity and, and how to bring technology into this. But technology is there. In many, many cases, we just need to know how to combine them. So these three streams shared between partners, one-to-one -one or one-to-many, public, private, or private, private, uh, they do not only represent a stream of a resource that you can ha hold in your hand, it also represents the trust, the sharing of innovation, of data, the job creation, the innovation attracting investments and so on, and it's a co-investment uh, partnership also. So this is uh, it's going in both directions, it's going in all directions. You can also see there's a few streams going away from the partnership, so we are actually generating value uh, from this partnership based on secondary resources, so waste to the nearby community and, uh, and the region. So this is also what you can actually gain from this, that you could create value at a much bigger, uh, in a much bigger area, creating new types of businesses also. Um, next slide, please. I'm not gonna go too much into this because of a limited time, but just to say that this is, an, is an, what we call an old lady that kind of had a kind of facelift because we revisited re, uh, the way we were working uh, we have reorganized into uh, become a, a, a private non-profit association with the secretariat being within that. We, uh, previously, we were actually within the municipality, but we needed room to move, uh, the flexibility, dynamics that, that we need to actually do this. So uh, this is how we operate today, uh, but it has changed over time. It, didn't, it, it wasn't planned as a project. It's something that grew organically by local heroes, entrepreneurs, 
who actually found out to do business in a smart way. That meant financially, of course, but also with the economic benefit and the socio-economic benefit. Uh, so today, uh, we are this association and we facilitate uh, that these uh, members, the advisory boards, meet four, five, six times a year. We have a working group and an, an invasion uh, board uh, and an advisory board to actually support some of these ideas that are emerging or about to be realized, but where we need to work together to actually realize these things. Next slide, please. So uh, what is important, that has been important, is even more important now, is actually to establish a, a mission and a vision together in the partnership. And that is a tricky part. But once you're there, of course, uh, this will drive the development quite dramatically uh, to, some, to some ambitions at a speed uh, and with some outputs that you could never imagine. So getting your acts together, working together, public private to try and, and, and at least draft a mission and a vision is so important. We're working on that and then it's continuously developing now, but that is really a very strong common identity, uh, a kind of a platform to work from. Because this is a kind of a, a way to agree on a number of issues. Uh, so we know exactly where we stand and where to walk towards. So we have a, a, an action plan now and also a roadmap developed in partnership. So uh, through this, we have agreed that we want to renew the partnership. So new, new companies we would like to invite in, associated partnerships we would like to invite in. Um, we would like to connect, so look at also the difficult uh, synergies, the difficult technologies and resource streams to create value from that. And of course, as we sit here today, we would like to be better at sharing this mindset and this knowledge, also to get something back, learn something. Next slide, please. We work together based on the good idea. So we sit together in this partnership, in working groups, advisory board, and agree on is this a good idea or not. If not, maybe we will have to leave it and revisit it, or maybe we just need to, have to work on the good idea. And then we can move on from there again, agreeing what is a good idea, uh, and uh, then we can actually develop it in, towards a proof of concept, remembering sustainability, and then getting to uh, commercial production. And what is a, a very strong in our old cluster history is that uh, we have created resilience in the partnership because when something does not work anymore, if a company do not no longer uh, produce a, speci uh, a special residue, we will just simply reinvent ourselves and, f uh, and look for new synergies that could actually support uh, businesses. So this is just a model of how we work together. We call it symbiosis readiness level. So how ready are we to move towards the next steps? Um, yes, next slide, please. Uh, I was mentioning uh, both an innovation board and, and advisory board. We use the innovation board to do kind of a quick assessment of new technologies or companies requesting to actually work together with our partners. So we need to uh, act fast. And if it's very mature, we might as well get the value out of it as soon as possible. Advisory board is linked to this, but it's more like the more difficult matters where we need to discuss, invite uh, technology uh, providers or universities, knowledge institutions in and help us discuss. We might even want to apply for funding to do the test and demonstration uh, locally, on site at the businesses or develop with uh, uh, foreign, foreign consortiums to actually uh, learn how to do this. So we work at, at these two different levels the fast and the slower track, the here and now and in, in the future. So next step, please. Uh, next slide, please. <laughs> so does this uh, make value or bring value? And it definitely does. Uh, it takes a lot of uh, effort based on a lot of trust to actually get to the numbers. But we actually managed to do that. And once we did, I mean, we really had something to communicate. And this is where we can actually really move the pro both, both the public and private partners towards doing more because we need to understand what it is we are, we are creating. So we are annually saving almost 600,000 tons of CO2. Remember, this is, uh, it, this is uh, nine private and, and uh, no, it's 10 private and, and four public private uh, companies. So uh, quite a few, but quite a big uh, carbon footprint saving. We save at least 4 million cubic of uh, drinking water, groundwater each year, and then we save uh, 62,000 tons of, of uh, materials as it is for now. Next slide, please. So along with that, we have been able to really attract investments to this area. 
uh, new existing companies are expanding, uh, but also new companies, national and international, are actually coming to Calumbo, uh, asking for membership, asking for, to become part of this uh, symbiosis mindset to develop their business based on this uh, sustainable approach, decarbonization. And then uh, we could create jobs, and uh, I mean, you can actually now educate yourself, or your children can educate themselves with, to get uh, five different new types of diplomas within, uh, yeah, it's within the middle, long, and long education uh, sector. Next slide, please. And then uh, I'd like to just uh, finish by saying that what we have moved on to is actually working uh, also nationally uh, uh, with uh, emerging or maturing uh, cases or hubs like ours to learn but also to share. Uh, and we have learned just, it's just a one year old um, story. It, was kick, it had a kick off last year, November, and we are having our first annual meeting uh, uh, three weeks from now. Uh, uh, but this is a really important, I think, and uh, value-creating way uh, for both the emerging and the mature ones to actually get together and, and uh, collaborate, share information, strategies, uh, visions, uh, to, to actually realize uh, decarbonization and create the value at multiple levels that was already mentioned. So that's, I mean, uh, just to encourage you guys that I think what you're doing now in Oregon Portland, but then should be maybe spread out to Oregon. I think it's, it makes so much sense. Uh, we see the uh, we see the effects of this already now. Uh, so I think that's a really important way forward. But of course, you need to get your your own local partnership in in, in good shape. Uh, and I think you're already quite far uh, with this nice initiative. And looking ahead, it looks very promising. And also from the screenings we had yesterday and. And one more in two days. I think uh, you are uh, you have uh, have a lot of capacity. Uh, so uh, really good to see. And thank you for giving us the opportunity. Thank you so much, Per and Meta and Klaus. We're so excited that you're here. It was very informative. Um, so next, uh, we will welcome two of our elected counterparts: Multnomah County Commissioner Sushila Jayapal and Metro C Councilor Duncan Wong, who are both, uh, who both joined us in Denmark. So welcome both of you. Thank you so much, Commissioner Rubio. Um, you know, I'll start by saying I just felt so fortunate to participate on this delegation. And what you've heard this morning is a small sample and a very high level sample of the kind of information that we got. The real value was in seeing how this these models translate on the ground. And I wish there were a way to convey that. I, I certainly can't adequately convey it. Um, I think our Danish partners could with a lot more time. But I, I just wanna, I, I'm here really to ex, uh, express the support of my colleagues on the Multnomah County Board of Commissioners for the work that you are embarking on. And I wanna thank Commissioner Rubio and her team for their vision and their leadership in starting this project. I wanna thank our Danish colleagues for their um, Hospitality, yes, but really their generosity in terms of wanting to share all of the lessons they've learned with us and with others really around the, around the globe. So thank you so much for that. Um, you know, I think we all learned many, many things. Um, my one takeaway, which you're going to hear over and over again, it's not a new thought, is that it really is possible to achieve both a thriving industrial sector and a carbon neutral climate friendly, friendly future. Um, Achieving those goals requires, I had written collaboration, but as I listened to you, meta symbiosis is really the word. It requires an understanding that there's an interdependent relationship between government, business, academia, and the community. Our role as government, I, I think, and this was borne out by what we heard, is to be the backbone of the effort, to create the framework for collaboration and symbiosis, to set the goals, to hold our partners accountable to those shared goals while also giving them the flexibility to be creative and innovative and to provide consistency and support as they engage in that effort. Throughout our time in Denmark, we saw concrete examples, and I use that literally and metaphorically because we did actually see a cement plant. Um, we saw concrete examples of how this kind of partnership has yielded innovative solutions to technological problems resulted in climate goals not only being met but exceeded and in the process created jobs and thriving communities. 
as a Multnomah County Commissioner, as a representative of the local public health authority, we are keenly aware of the health consequences of poor environmental conditions and climate change, ranging from diesel emissions on asthma rates to the tragic consequences of severe weather events caused by climate change. And Multnomah County also deals every day with the consequences of poverty, income inequality, and barriers to economic progress. And we know that good living wage jobs are essential to our residents' ability to thrive. I mention these things because Multnomah County's connection to industry and business is not as obvious as the city's, but here's where we see the connection, that it directly impacts the work that we do and the people that we serve. To conclude, um, one of the speakers we heard from was a representative of Dansk Industry, an association of more than 19,000 Danish businesses. He described the association's value statement in this way. Denmark should be the best country to live in and the best country to do business in, and the two are inextricably linked. In other words, back to the interdependence of the relationship between thriving businesses, thriving people, and a thriving planet. I look forward to applying the lessons we've learned and will continue to learn from our Danish partners here in Multnomah County. Thank you. And hi, uh, good morning, everyone. This is uh, Duncan Huang joining from Zoom. I'm a Metro Councilor serving District 6, which is Southeast Southwest Portland. And I just want to start by thanking uh, our city partners and Commissioner Rubio for the invite. And it's great to see our Danish guests. I want to thank them so much for their hosp hospitality. It was just such a informative and rewarding trip. I think the thing that stuck out to me besides all the great visits and you know technology and all the windmills or wind farms was really just the spirit of cooperation. And it really just appeared and felt like all the stakeholders and citizens of Denmark really set this North Star of um, you know, climate and economic development, and everyone was moving on that path together in coordination. And that is really something that is beautiful. And, you know, hopefully we can replicate some elements of that where we can create kind of this North Star and buy in and move the public and private sector towards that. Um, so I was glad I was able to go as a representative of Metro. You know, a couple of things that we'll be working on that are relevant to kind of that spirit of co collaboration uh, really comes down to regional planning and land use. Um, we'll be taking up the urban growth boundary conversation uh, next year. And, you know, as part of the new uh, semiconductor task force that recently did a study, we know that there are just two industrial developable sites um, uh, in the entire region for industry of just 82 acres. Uh, so I think that's one thing we'll be looking at is, you know, how do we take a regional perspective uh, to, to this work? You know, it's not just about the city of Portland, but we have uh, counterparts in Washington and Clackamas County, and, you know, our economy is a regional economy. So we need to be really thoughtful about how we're going to tackle kind of land use and uh, creation of more industrial land. Um, the other thing that's you know really interesting for the city of Portland is Metro operates the Portland Expo Center, which is on you know prime industrial land, and we have currently have a request for expressions of interest out. Uh, we have a number of different uh, ideas coming together, and one of them is based on upcycling and recycling. Uh, so how do we turn you know that last bit of industrial land in Portland? into something that really serves these purposes of collaboration. And finally, uh, as a regulator of, of waste systems, I've been really thinking about how we can uh, copy a lot of a Danish model and turn our waste and you know, food waste and biomass into other products and collaborating with the city of Portland. So I took a lot from this trip and I really look forward to building upon you know, the collaborations locally that we need to be successful. So thank you so much for your time. Thank you, Councillor Wong, and thank you, Commissioner Jayapal, for joining us here today and for your comments and your partnership. It's really important that we have a collaborative approach as we, we do this work together among our government agencies. 
Um, so now I will, will welcome our business partners and fellow travelers, Benton Strong with Vigor, Orlando Simpson with Core, and Don Hunter with Ebrez. Welcome. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio. Thank you, Mayor Wheeler and the members of the council for uh, bringing us together for today's conversation. And I also want to echo our thanks to our Danish partners, both for your hospitality and for then coming all the way back here uh, to visit us and, and help us out. We're looking forward to having you at Vigor tomorrow. Uh, my name is Benton Strong. I work at Vigor, um, your Portland-based ship repair and complex fabrication company down on Swan Island. Um, I not only represented Vigor, but I had the tremendous opportunity to represent the Portland Business Alliance on this trip to Denmark. Uh, as a values-driven company, Vigor has long believed that we must be good stewards of the community that is around us, but also our environment. Uh, we see the transition to a clean energy future not just as imperative, but as a major economic opportunity for the region. Clean technology will be built by our major manufacturers. Energy will be moved and supplied by our, by our utilities. And the new processes that we need will be developed and utilized by some new, but also by our existing companies. This is an opportunity to take meaningful action on climate change while creating more of the family wage jobs that exist in our industrial and manufacturing sector. That's not, this not only strengthens our region's economy, it also makes it more equitable based on who we know works in these roles and the opportunities that exist today, not just looking in the future in those industries. In Denmark, we learned two key ingredients needed to make this a reality, a shared goal, an uncommon collaboration, which you've heard about quite a bit today, but will be a shift for us here in the United States and particularly in our region. We are closer on a shared goal than I think most people think, and the relationships, which was a key part of this trip, the relationships we were able to build during this exchange will help define that goal and refine it as we go forward. However, for as long as most of us can remember, the gap between all the stakeholders, but particularly government and business, on this issue specifically has been widening. Denmark delivered a message many of us probably already knew, but needed to see in action. We will only be successful if we find a common path to achieve our shared goal. Government will play a central role in supporting and leading this work, and I want to thank Director Oliveira and his team at BPS for being a partner in this work over the last several months and really the last year. But businesses will also have to step up and engage in serious efforts to reduce emissions and build new technologies. And we'll have to ensure we do this differently than we've ever done it before to ensure that the communities traditionally harmed by pollution and climate change will be the leading beneficiaries of our transition. Portland can build and export climate and clean technology solutions. We as businesses are committed to helping lead that effort. And I just lastly want to thank the three elected leaders who joined us, Commissioner Rubio, Commissioner Jayapal, and Commissioner Huang. We're really grateful for your partnership and we look forward to continuing this work. Thank you. Good job, B. Am I on? Gotcha. Appreciate it. No, um, sometimes I typically go off script in a lot of these public settings. So for, for, for today, I'm going to stay in between the boundaries and, and stick to my actual testimony. Um, <laughs> I'm going to try. Um, well, Mayor Wheeler, Wheeler <clears throat> members of the Portland City Council, for the record, uh, my name is Orlando Simpson. I am the CEO of CORE, otherwise known as City of Rose Disposal and Recycling, which is a 25-year-old, 100% African-American-owned local benefit corporation that is focused on solid waste recycling and materials management for our local economy. I am here today um, and as much as I'd love to sit before you and talk about myself and my company and our East Portland circular economy business model and development plans and our two plus years work with sustainable Center for Sustainable Infrastructure on industrial symbiosis, I thought I would take a little different path. The singular mindset of the 20th century that brought us all here today has fortunately become the vehicle to a different conversation and different perspective that I want to bring to light as we prepare ourselves to advance from an extractive economy to a living economy which fosters regeneration. And first and foremost, aside from that, I'd, I'd be remiss if I didn't acknowledge individuals like Donnie Oliveira and his staff who have displayed real leadership by creating an authentic and genuine table full of diverse perspectives, values, cultures, and ideas surrounding this clean industry work. 
This is a real ground game and collaborative hard work that our community needs in order to get the city of Portland back into its destined position as an international leader in developing sustainable ecosystems. The greatest lesson we can take from our predecessors who only possess that singular mindset is that they did not invest in a table of diverse perspectives to prepare us for the challenges of today. Those that have been making all the decisions that decide the fate of all humans have been able to obtain success with one perspective in mind, making money by any means necessary. And I want to be very clear and explicit here. When I say, when I say this, making money is not bad at all. And if you need a reference, just look at Patagonia. Making money is bad when it is used to dehumanize the means of prosperity to ourselves and the planet. And there are many people that still practice this ideology, even in our own city. The only way we can move past that is by carving a new humanistic approach to how we govern, conduct business, innovate, and decarbonize our future. This is why DEI is at the center of every conversation these days. Of course, we want to be equitable by including diverse perspectives to the table. However, by continuing to permit polarization to fossil fuel our differences, it will only lead to our demise. <clears throat> How I see it as a fourth generation black and Hispanic Portlander is that this is all about diverse perspectives standing by the covenant of compromise. Maybe today this becomes a catalyst to us getting it right. Maybe we can finally look at doing things differently. What if we dare to be on the same page? What if we commit to real unbiased discussions? What if we seek inclusiveness in our outcomes? What if we actually change the course of how we conduct business? I'm sitting here because I'm invested into getting it right going forward, not for ourselves, but for our future generations. Sustainable economic development is the advancement of humanity and if we cannot see that, then we are blinded by our own arrogance and lack of perspective, just like our predecessors. It is our obligation to address the invisible challenges of the 21st century, as we cannot solve for our future problems with the mindset of today. And I just want to make sure that I acknowledge everybody on this trip. This is a very humbling experience for me. Um, I've done a lot of best practices trips around the, around the country and around the planet with other delegation groups. And um, I would say this was probably the most authentic group that I've ever been around. Um, everybody comes from different walks of life, different backgrounds, different perspectives, different life experiences, different bosses, different objectives, different joys, different loves. And if we cannot get this right and utilize this table as the model of how we course correct our society, then we've missed our big opportunity. Thank you. Thank you so much, Alondo. Hi. <clears throat> My name is Don Hunter. I'm the senior vice president for a company called Evraz, uh, which until 2007 was known as Oregon Steel Mills. Um, I'd like to thank the mayor, the city commissioners, for having us here today. Uh, additionally, I would like to thank the representatives from Denmark who traveled literally halfway around the planet to come help us begin our journey uh, to sustainable and clean energy. So thank you for coming. I represent Evraz, as I stated. It's been uh, in Portland for over 70 years. We make steel plate and coils and other steel, other steel products, and we've evolved over the years to become the steel mill out on, uh, it's called in, out in North Portland. Um, in that time, there's been significant changes in how businesses interact with communities around them, and as social ideas begin to change, those expectations influence economic and environmental policies, so businesses have to change. We have to change or we evolve out of existence. Portland has had a long history of leading the pack when it comes to getting things right. As Portland sets the standard for progressive policies in creating something that other cities have not, a coalition of progressive leaders like those assembled here today, community leaders, community activists, and local business leaders. Getting accomplished, what we need to achieve will take all of us. Improving the business climate, decreasing our carbon footprint, and becoming a community of inclusion and diversity can only be accomplished by working together. Recently, a group of us took a trip to Denmark to see the world's leading country in becoming green and self-sustaining. And while I enjoyed my visit to their wonderful country, I came home more excited than when I left. I'm excited because of what I saw there can be implemented here. Not in exactly the same format. They have some advantages that we don't have. But in general, what we learn, I think, can be implemented to increase our business and reduce our carbon footprint. 
Denmark created an environment of leadership where social activists, community leaders got together, environmental leaders, businesses, to create an environment that drives success and collaboration. They create an environment that encourages thought leaders, an environment that rewards teamwork and acknowledged best effort, and through their leadership, created a world-class green outcome. Denmark has a few advantages on us. While they created a greenfield site, which refers to having open land and starting from ground zero. We don't necessarily have that in all cases in Portland. But what they do have is something that we don't have yet, and that's the culture. Working together on a common goal, of, I apologize. So what I saw over there, um, Okay, apologize for losing my place. Let's utilize what we learned there and take away from them the most valuable of all lessons, which was working together. It must be our new normal. As stated in your presentation, that's the new normal. We have to change what we consider normal and make that our new normal. Um, working together on a common goal developed by all stakeholders. What I saw in Denmark was the amazing results that they achieved. It wasn't a small group of activists that had radical requests. It wasn't unreasonable legislation that businesses can't comply with create an environment where taxes eliminate businesses and businesses move across the water or to a different state. It wasn't businesses refusing to invest because it's easy to say we can't do anymore, we've done enough, or there's no ROI on the investment. And I think all three of those things have happened in Portland. I saw a culture that was created where everyone understood the goal and everyone participated. I witnessed a social environment that created success using thought leaders from industry, universities, social activists, and of course local business leaders and the local and federal governments. Inclusiveness was a foundational building block of what they've achieved, not an add-on after the fact as a secondary or tertiary thought. As I look at the group assembled here today to evaluate the task before us, I have confidence. Confidence that we can all create change here in Portland and the metro area and that we can and will work together confidence that we have an opportunity that we must take advantage of and not let slip away. It's an opportunity to build on and create green, but we can only be successful if we work together, all of us, government officials, businesses, and social groups alike. I'd like to thank everyone for attending today, remain committed in supporting the group to make Portland a showcase city for how to successfully create a cutting edge, successful, and inclusive place to live and work. Thank you to all involved who helped us put together the trip, Commissioner Rubio, uh, Rice. Um, and especially the, the group from Denmark in receiving us and treating us wonderfully and also in reciprocating and coming again halfway around the world here and all the government officials who made it possible. Thank you. Thank you so much, Don, and thank you, Orlando, and, and thank you as well, Benton, for your words. It's really important words today, and it really demonstrates how we are at a critical, consequential point as a city. We want to be on the same page. We want to go in the same direction. So really appreciate your words today. Um, next, we have, um, I want to welcome Joshua Bassofin from uh, Climate Solutions. Uh, Climate Solutions is a strong uh, climate advocacy organization, organization that lifts up good practices and policy solutions, as well as holding us accountable in moving forward to reach our climate goals. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Rubio, and good morning, Mayor, Commissioners, Delegates. Thank you for convening this session to discuss the significant clean energy innovations achieved in Denmark and the potential for implementing them here in Portland. Denmark, with a current mix of 80% clean energy and on track to meet 100% by 2030, is a case study for what we seek to achieve in Oregon through HB 2021, our 100% clean energy law. And as our Danish uh, peers mentioned, they, they are also moving to be carbon, carbon neutral across their entire economy. With industrial symbiosis, the Danes have fostered a process for businesses to share waste, water, and energy streams to lower greenhouse gas emissions improve efficiency, and save money. Industrial symbiosis has attracted foreign investment and collaboration across several continents. Denmark has also pioneered solutions for hard to decarbonize sectors through the Power to X model, utilizing renewable electrolytic hydrogen to produce a variety of fuels. Power to X could transform the production of fuels for the maritime and aviation sectors, ammonia for fertilizers, fuel cells for heavy duty transportation, and electricity storage, all of which are very important to Oregon's economy. 
Finding solutions for these industries is key to our statewide and also national decarbonization goals. The Danish maritime shipper Maersk is already piloting a Power to X facility in Texas where they will be uh, producing uh, green methanol for shipping, which is very, very exciting. The city of Portland can and should work with the state and stakeholders to bring these innovative solutions to our region. Doing so will continue to show our already solid leadership on climate and bring jobs and investments to Oregon. Denmark has become a global leader in fighting climate change through creativity, innovative thinking, and an ability to reach a national consensus. The Danes have also benefited from a robust regional transmission network and significant wind energy resources. We have the same challenges here in Oregon and a need for the same kind, kinds of solutions to fully decarbonize our state. But we don't have the same culture, political dynamics, and in infrastructure as Denmark. That's why it's so important to build partnerships and collaborations and to seek avenues for disseminating, testing, piloting, and implementing these innovations at home. Climate Solutions works across the state with multiple partners in government, industry, nonprofits, and community groups to find solutions to decarbonize. We know how important partnerships are, and we're grateful that the city of Portland has dedicated significant resources to this effort, and we're ready and willing to assist. We're proud to be a member of this coalition, and we thank the mayor and commissioners um, and all of the delegates, and particularly uh, our, our uh, colleagues at the county level and in the bureaus, and we look forward to the next steps. Thank you. Thank you so much, Joshua. Finally, uh, before we ca carve out some time for Q&A, I want to hand the floor over to Director Olivera of the Bureau of Planning and Sustainability. Thank you, Commissioner. I actually wanted to defer to create more space and time for you all to ask questions, because we covered a lot, and I wanted to ensure that. So I'm happy to save my comments until, yeah. Thank you. Anybody questions, colleagues? Well, I, I have a couple. I'll, I'll jump in. Uh, first of all, thank you for this presentation today. I thought this was terrific, and frankly, it's inspiring. And it's great to uh, have not only leaders come from Denmark to show us what is possible, but it's also to have great local leaders here in the room to also espouse, I think, a very important vision for the future of this city. And it, it dovetails with interesting conversations we're having around government. And so my question is really about government. You have the secretariat, as I understand it, and you gave a good presentation on the secretariat, uh, but I'm not entirely familiar with the term or its role. I didn't hear you mention your federal government. I didn't hear you mention your city municipal government. Um, this is something completely different, and it seems like it's more a body of the public. Can you describe what is the goal of the Secretariat, and what tools specifically does the Secretariat have at its disposal to be able to shape the circular economy that you described? Well, thank you for the question. Um, I mean, it's important to understand when we say the Secretariat of the Carlin Bosnian Moses, is, it is, of course, this local initiative that has impact, uh, not only locally. So it's really a secret Secretariat that was created based on the decision by these local public-private partners in the existing partnership to say we need to work much closer together, we need to organize ourselves, we need to have a systemic approach, we need to look at systems, and for this complexity, we need to kind of have a small group of uh, people that can facilitate this. So the Secretariat of Kalambal Symbiosis is really something that has been, I mean, just created by these local partners, this local partnership to facilitate, first of all, locally. Because what you need, what you need to realize this is somebody that will be locally known, respected, active, engaging, and uh, disturbing both the public and the private, and bringing them together, suggesting new ideas, new partnership, the unexpected partnership. So this has to be gone going all the time, because when Core, Everest, and Viga need to go back and do their production, they need to, of course, focus on that, but they need somebody to sometimes uh, call them up, send them an email, invite them in, disturb them a bit, and bring them together, uh, because 
they need to produce, of course. So you need those local facilitators, and that is what the Secretariat is about. So we are not governmentally funded. We are funded through the membership of these partners. Okay, that's, but, that's interesting. Yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. go ahead. But, I mean, we are four people. So now it's very low practical now. We are four people, so it, that we are only funded through the membership funding one person, okay. the head of Secretariat. The three other pe people, me and Meta included, we are funded through doing consultancy projects uh, and so on. Do you have the authority of regulation, or no. is this a coalition of the willing, and you get together and you agree on what the terms and the rules are going to be? Is that how it works? We have no decision power at all. We're just okay. employees hired in in the Secretariat within this private association trying to assist and yeah, develop uh, the local partnership, existing but also new green business models in partnership. And of course, try and facilitate that this also links to attracting investments, building on existing and new education schemes, uh, yeah, communicating on what we do, have done, and what we maybe should do, so do strategic work together with the members of this uh, local network. So we try and, and help them um, based on their mission and their vision, uh, develop this and, and to, yeah, in, uh, in, yeah, dynamically over time as things develop in society, but also locally. Uh, try to I influence also uh, legal uh, issues, uh, the legal framework. Uh, for instance, water scarcity. We have helped try to push towards that we can actually not only use groundwater as drinking water now, but with the right setting and technology uh, certification, we can also now, hopefully, being decided just this month, we can also include surface water and salt water into that. Mobilizing other types of waste resources to save groundwater for highest purpose and only use the quality where it's needed, not about that. Okay. Could, could I ask a second question and, and possibly a third? Let's make the colleagues have a stack of questions. Uh, the second is this 99-person council. That struck me as extremely interesting, and maybe the most provocative thing you said all day was that they are randomly selected. Can you explain what you meant when you said this council is populated by people who are randomly selected? And, and the reason I raise this is I've always had this sort of academic question in my mind about local government and what it would be like if we just randomly selected people from the community like we do for jury duty and said, this is your year, congratulations, you're on the city council. But you sort of jumped the, the, to the end here with your 99 member council. Tell me a little bit more about that. Who, yes. who is on it? I assume they, there are people who self-identify as being interested. And then I assume you have to make sure there's some balancing in perspectives. But I wanted to little know, know a little bit more about that governance model, because that's where you develop your public credibility, right? Yeah, so, so maybe it's important to stress from the beginning that this, this assembly doesn't have any decision-making power. It's just feeding into the political process, and it's, it's being heard, and they get, uh, um, they get public attention because this is a new a new thing that's been uh, been defined, and it's yeah, it's almost going back to the the old Greece where democracy was completely random, right? Uh, and you just pick random men to to govern the state. Uh, but as I said, they don't have any decision making powers. Exactly how they are randomly picked, I, I don't know. I would have to look that up. Okay, but cool. it is but it is random, and you know, the, the, I, I guess they kind of split the population into. Uh, different parts, so you have, depending on where they live and the age and the income uh, and, and gender and so on, and then from there they, they pick randomly. But of course, uh, the, the, the persons they pick, they would have to, to agree to be in this council. And, and, and uh, I just read the, the preface of their first report saying that some of the members spent enormous amount of time defining the recommendations and others were only there for some of the meetings. So uh, obviously it's not a perfect system, but I think it's, it's a way for the politicians to include the broader public. And you know, we have a representative uh, democracy in Denmark, but there is sometimes the, 
the the feeling that the politicians are they are in their ivory tower making all the decisions without the the good connection to to uh, to ordinary people and i think this is this is a system to to kind of uh, bridge the gap there uh, of course there are voices also in denmark that actually want to create uh, we only have a one chamber system in our in our government, in our uh, politic, uh, political system. And you could imagine to have a second chamber where you actually pick people randomly, and some people are pushing for this. I don't know if it's ever going to happen, but uh, I hope that answered your question. Very well. Thank you. I appreciate it. And again, uh, thank you for being here. Uh, colleagues? Uh, Commissioner, Commissioner Hardesty, then Commissioner Maps, then Commissioner Ryan. Then you can finish this out with your questions. Great. Uh, thank you, Mayor. Uh, I want to start by really, really appreciating Commissioner Rubio and the extraordinary delegation that's here from Denmark. You have my humblest apologies that I am not in the room with you today, but it is that kind of season for me, and I could not be in the room. The mayor stole one of my questions because I tried to imagine how a 99 member community oversight board would operate that represented uh, rural and urban voices that represented people who were living life in different ways. And I, I, I let me just say that that's a pretty remarkable um, uh, uh, effort and certainly uh, provides much more opportunity to engage and I think the term you use, I laughed because I use that term a lot, regular people. Because there are a lot of self, there are a lot of people who think they're the experts, but it is really the regular people that know best. I'm really interested in how you're able to get the various political parties to unanimously support a vision for a climate uh, resilient future. Um, so that's my question. <laughs> I, I think that's a very difficult uh, question to answer. I mean, uh, you know, it, it's 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 the atmosphere and the and the and the the, the political mainstream in Denmark is basically uh, that we have to uh, to be very ambitious ambitious when it comes to to climate uh, the climate issue, and there's basically only one one and a half party in the government, in the, in the parliament that are uh, less uh, committed to this agenda. And it's, it's really a, a broad, broad push from, from I, I don't know how to answer it. It's, it that's just the way it is. <laughs> uh, well, let me just say that I'm just a little jealous because nothing's that easy in the United States of America. So I, 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 I don't know what, what was in the sauce, but I think it's just really remarkable that you could have a vision that would be incorporated and embraced across the spectrum. Um, that, that has not been our experience here in the United States. Well, thanks a lot. And, and, I, and I also have to say, of course, there's a lot of discussion and a lot of uh, disagreement uh, between the different political parties when you get into the detail uh, of the matter, but the overall goal uh, is there. Maybe I could just add a comment to this. Please. Um, not that we should talk about the uh, size of the country, but still I think our history and still, I mean, being humble and understanding that we are a very small part of the world. And uh, I mean, we, we need to cut the crap. <laughs> and we need not to, uh, I mean, move away from each other, but we need actually to move together and yes. discuss in s seriously, in detail, honestly, what are the difficult things also within our own opinion and within our own parties. I mean, we need to develop all the time. So I think uh, we can be very informal. Also, the politicians, when they sit down away from the screens and the radios and the journalists, uh, they can sit down and discuss also the very difficult things without... Uh, I mean, blaming the others for what they then was informed. So confidentiality also between politicians when they go into the secret rooms and discuss things. That I think that's very important understanding that we need 
to work together in Denmark, but also to work together with the world and actually to reach our goals and the goals that we need to achieve, not just simply want to, but what is necessary. So the urgency, I think, has become very real, also just recently, and we know all why. So uh, doing things alone will not bake the cake. and We need all the ingredients that we can have from partners to actually at all be able to mix the, the dough and, and bake the cake in order to have a cake, right? Okay. So I think it's, uh, I think kind of that setting, I think actually adds to, uh, to maybe one of the uh, reasons why we, we are capable of doing that. And I think we are all. It's a matter of, matter of actually just twisting the mindset a bit and understanding that we're part of something big, very big. Well <clears throat> Thank you for that. Um, and I will say again, I'm a little jealous because uh, we still are dealing with people who don't believe climate change is real um, and don't believe that we have to actually change behavior or outcomes. Uh, someone mentioned that there were four, uh, uh, four kind of planks in how the community uh, uh, process worked. There was trust, accountability, inclusiveness, and I missed the fourth one. Maybe the last one was confidentiality. Confidentiality, thank you. Yeah. Because I, I, will, uh, I could talk all day, but I really am appreciative of Commissioner Rubio um, and was a little jealous that she got to go to Denver, but Denver, uh, Denmark, and Denmark is still on my uh, bucket list, just so you know. Commissioner thank Maps. You. Uh, thank you, Mr. Mayor. Let me start out by thanking uh, Commissioner Rubio and our guests from Denmark for um, organizing today's workshop. I know we're tight on time, so I, what I want to do is ask three quick questions. Um, and uh, I'll do this, I'll give people uh, uh, some quick heads up. Um, to our friends from Denmark, one of the things I'd like to explore are the incentives that you've used in order to encourage green technologies. If you have any sort of insights into what sort of incentives seems to work pretty well, I'd love to hear more about that. Then to my friends in the private sector who went on this trip, I'd be interested to hear in the things that you saw in Denmark that you're excited about bringing back to Portland and to planning and sustainability over in uh, City Hall staff. I'd be interested in hearing um, uh, what you saw that you're excited to bring back to Portland. But let me start with my first question, which goes to our guests from Denmark. Uh, here, I'm thinking about that slide that you showed, which was a bell curve. Uh, and on the left end of the slide, you had kind of dirty technologies. And you said, and it illustrated, in order to deal with dirty technologies, you basically ban them or disincentivize them. And then in the fat part of the bell curve, you try to tax to basically push people over to the green side. And then on the far right side, um, you have green technologies which you try to uh, promote through incentives. And I'm curious about what you've learned and if you have any insight about the kinds of incentives that work in this space. Um, and if there's anything that we should be thinking about as we think about ways to um, encourage people to move in this direction. Well, I think for the, for the incentives, uh, I mean, the, the prime example of Denmark is the, the wind turbine industry uh, where we threw in a lot of subsidies for wind turbines in the 80s and the 90s. It was uh, quite expensive, but it created a, a good uh, local market for wind turbines, and uh, which was, uh, I mean, obviously it pays off now because we, we produce a lot of, a, a lot of them and, and, and export them. So I, I think uh, so subsidies, one thing, a good research, uh, uh, support for research, good universities, and, and support for, for, for basic research and energy technologies. And then uh, thirdly, and maybe most important, I would think, building uh, competitive markets where these good ideas can compete because the best ideas will, in the end, will win. And, will win. and I, I believe that, uh, you know, having, uh, having a, a good market framework where people can uh, compete on, on uh, equal uh, footing is, is uh, vital for, for creating new technologies and having them implemented. Yeah. Uh, thank, you. Uh, thank you very much for that. Um, now let me turn to our uh, friends in the private sector. You each represent very different businesses, uh, but got to look at um, 
a really compelling model of how um, at least one country goes about organizing themselves towards a building a greener future. Um, does anyone have any, did anyone see anything that you're excited about bringing back to Portland? I'm going to jump in first, Benton. It's okay? Okay. Just want to make sure. Um, no, I think the one most important um, asset and, and I'm not just going to refer to Denmark because it, was, it seems like it's a successful model everywhere as it pertains to best practices, which is the, 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 the cross-coordination, which I believe Commissioner Jayapal mentioned it earlier, in bringing in academia. Academia is underutilized in our city, and that connection between academia and business um, is going to be really, really important for our growth and our prosperity and really standing up sustainable economic development strategy going forward. Uh, we have a lot of untapped potential that are in our higher ed institutions. Um, and as Portland State, which I had just heard in a meeting the other day around the inclusive economic development strategy that it controls almost 30% of the land downtown, um, we have a lot of opportunity in front of us and the institution is getting more and more diverse every year. And so if we're not investing in that human capital and that human potential, and, and, and connecting those dots between higher ed and business and innovation, um, then we're gonna be talking about these same things in the next decade. Yeah, I'll just, I'll just add a couple. So I'm gonna say two things. And it was about a year ago that I first had a meeting with Don and BPS when we were talking about the, the clean air, healthy communities fees. And Don gave a really incredible and passionate speech about how some in, in companies with industrial processes, like both of our companies have, do not have another option right now in our energy source. And instead of coming up with a small way of taxing us to try to get rid of it, let's actually figure out how to solve the problem. And so Power to X to me was a very interesting concept for us to learn. Is there a way to get a type of energy source that would meet our targets, our goals, um, and actually make it scalable to something that our companies can use? And so. I, that combined with the, the way in which the, the Danish government did its climate targets, which said, hey, here's where we would like to go. Businesses, please go tell us how we can get there and send us what they sent. I think it was 400 recommendations to say, here's what we think we can do. Here's what we can do on our own. And here's where we need the government's help. Um, that is actually when we talk about the clean industry hub, it was perfect timing to have started that process before we went to Denmark because it's possible these two things could fit together. And so to me, that biggest takeaway plugged into something that we already have here. And, just, and I guess just to add to that, you know, what Benton said is, is critically important because we're the experts in our industry and you guys are experts in regulation and running a government. They did it the opposite way that it's typically done in the United States. They didn't hand down regulation and say, figure it out. They said, here's our goal. How do we get there? So the businesses led the idea of how to get there. And Fortunately, I guess for us in our country, capitalism starts to propel you toward the least expensive, best fit. And when it's regulation, NOx. You know, our company specifically spends a lot of money on NOx reductions because it's a problem. If we produce it, we have to pay and we get fined. So the natural incentive is there. But when I said cultural early in my, earlier in my discussion, what I meant was they think about it differently than we do. They think about, you know, they start with universities, as, as both these gentlemen said, and they say, how do we develop a process of being becoming circular? And what I got from that, and I'm excited to hear about, is how they chose industry to match up with the next industry next to it, right? And, and here's an example. I produce excess heat, and it's heat I can't dissipate. There's no way to get rid of it. We reheat steel, and so a massive amount of heat is lost in that process. It's not only inefficient, it costs us money. It's wasted because someone half a mile down the road or a mile down the road might need heat, so they have to produce heat. What I saw in Denmark was the idea that industry worked with the science and the technology and the, and the universities to say, what process does my company produce? What do I need for raw material? And what is my waste product? And then who, what process utilizes my waste product as their raw material? And when we saw that map, it was incredible to walk it. Seeing it's one thing on TV, or you see it on a screen, it's not the same when you walk from one company to the next, or you get on a bus and drive from one to the next, and you see pipelines taking this company's waste as a raw material for the next pipeline, right? Just, they just pipe it right to the next company. And so we don't think like that here. You know, Everaz tries to do the best thing for Everaz and the environment, and we pay taxes, and we try to do the right thing. And, the, you know, we may not work with vigor as, as much as we could, but it started with the concept of circularity. And, and we don't, it's not natural in the United States. It's just not. And one more thing I saw there was best available technology. When we talked about the left side of that bell curve, 
They didn't punish and tax people out of industry if they were in best available technology. What we don't have enough, I think, not specific to Portland, but in the US, we don't push people to utilize and, and penalize them if they're not using best available technology. When, when, like our reheat furnace, when you have the best available technology, we put in the best burners we can to reduce NOx production, but that technology is at its end. We need businesses and universities and political, political activist companies and, and, and social groups to get together and say, okay, instead of trying to get more efficient at burning natural gas, let's develop a, a, an alternative to natural gas, biomethane, right? There's a, there's a wastewater treatment plant right down on Columbia, just down the road from us, and we don't use any of their offtake, and we saw that in Denmark. We walked through a wastewater treatment plant that ends up producing a solid that is then creating methane, and I guess, I mean, it sounds corny, but what that really is is just teamwork. But it's a fun, it's a cultural acceptance of we're going to have a business here. What do I produce? What do I consume as raw material? And how do I help the guy next to me? And we kind of are siloed in companies. You know, Nike's not necessarily working with Adidas. Adidas is not ne necessarily working with Starbucks. And I don't mean to single them out. We aren't working with Vigor. We're not necessarily working with other people. We focus on what the best thing is for our company, you know, to reduce emissions and to meet all of the EPA standards. But that cultural idea of getting together like you did with the symbiosis and saying, I'm going to build a remilk factory. I'm coming here because your off product is my raw material so that you create that circularity. And I'm very excited. When I say I'm excited, it's much more than excitement. It can absolutely work here. I can. I can. Please be open. Great. Thank you. Uh, thank you. We're running short on time, but I do want to hear from staff. I believe that we had folks from Planning and Sustainability and Prosper on this trip. I'd be interested to hear about what uh, you saw that you're excited about bringing back to Portland. Yeah, yeah. I'll go briefly because brilliance has already been shared, so I'll just add on. One thing we're not talking about is the multiplier effect. And so one thing we are able to see at the Port of Alberg was all these efforts have downstream impacts on the rest of our economy. And so we, we witnessed and visited uh, an entrepreneurship center where a new business was able to use methanol from hydrolysis and all sorts of other processes to make new batteries. And they're looking to revolutionize boating. And so I think about small local companies. We have uh, Mayor Wheeler, we visited um, Photon Marine recently, who's, who's doing uh, electrification for boating. So I think about all the downstream impacts it could have for our local economy as well. Real quick, Commissioner, uh, there was two things systemically that I thought were really telling about how Denmark is approaching their climate goals with their industrial uh, development. One is that their climate solutions are also economic and wealth generating opportunities for their businesses. So to Don's point, they turned the challenge into solutions that also were generating export you know, opportunities, their own local wealth. And that's really valuable to what we're trying to solve for here in Portland, working with Prosper on that. And the second piece, as you've heard it all throughout every speaker today, is the collaborative spirit of this work. So this past summer, we brought up the climate emergency work plan that's laid out some pretty aggressive and daunting climate goals. And the hope that we have behind meeting those is that we have partnerships developing, still building that trust to get there because the city of Portland is not going to get our climate goals alone and we need the in industrial partners, we need our community partners uh, to be there at the table with us to find those solutions. Not just because the city is saying to do it, because they have ideas and they're helping us get there. Uh, thank you. Mr. Mayor, I'll hand the floor back to you. Thank you. Commissioner Ryan. Yeah, thank you, Mayor. Commissioner Rubio, thank you so much. This is, uh, in my two years in office, I'm more inspired by this work session than any I've been to. And it's because what all of you are saying, it's totally a cross sector, uh, very diverse point of views. You all do different things with your jobs. You have different constituents and we all need each other and we need to figure out what their shared goals are. Too often we have one lobby come and you better agree with them or not. And that's why we're in this place. So our country has created a lot of political situations which are like that. I also know that the work that you all put into this was really a lot of um, persistence, a lot of, it takes a lot of integrity and a lot of courage to bring people together. And I know there's some lost uh, translation words. <laughs> the mayor mentioned one. Random is a word that's used in our culture in such a different way than was presented. And I hear secretary and I think of a horse. So it's like people, um, you know, it was helpful that we got through those, those language um, translations. My point I want to also lift is your drivers, efficiency and system thinking. Multi-strained regulation, collaboration and shared goals, 
if we take that into everything we do at the city, whether it's permit improvement, it's how we improve our footprint, how we have clean air, no one polarized side is gonna get everything they want. We have to work together. So I wanna acknowledge all of that hard work that it takes to herd the cats. I don't know if that landed in translation. Um, when you bring people together to keep that common goal. And of course it takes people from the community that can lift that up. And we all need to find our proper lanes. So anyway, I just want to really spend some time acknowledging what I've heard from each and one of each one of you. And I also would love to dive deeper into data because that can be very political. That can be very challenging what you're going to measure. And having that common dashboard is a big part of this journey. I am gonna ask you a question, and that is this. I can only imagine that you've had some tough moments as you were convening this table. I can only imagine that the three of you have had long conversations about how to handle a certain situation which just occurred. I know that everyone in Denmark didn't just come to this meeting and everyone agreed with each other and it's all like this perfect utopia. Is that true? But that's not the question. Because <laughs> don't lie to me, I know it's not. So the point is, when you fell down, when it felt like the meeting fell down, when there was a tough moment, how did you move forward? Tell us a story of where things could have gone the wrong direction and how you kept the room together to keep moving forward for common goals. Because I love this diversity of the group that went on this trip, and I can just imagine you're not always gonna agree with one another. So what is it gonna take for all of you, and I'm looking at all of you, what's it gonna take for all of you to stay at the table? Now back to you, tell us the story. Well, this is maybe the, not the perfect story, but it's part one of the stories. Uh, back in 2011, um, as, at one of the uh, board, uh, board meetings, so the direct board of directors, uh, they were sitting around and there was not, nothing much on the agenda on that meeting. Remember they meet four, five, six times a year. Um, it, you remember the, the crisis in 2008, and this kind of was just following that. So uh, for a number of years, since 2008 till 11, the companies had been very occupied, 100%, maybe 110%, focused on how to trim their businesses, just looking at their own production, and simply just forgetting and walking away from this partnership model. So at that meeting in 11, they were actually considering if they should even meet again because I don't really have time to sit here. I should be back, right? Uh, so uh, they had two options in that meeting. Should we just simply stop and walk away and go back and do our business or should we continue but not continue as, as usual but increase? And that was where the public entity, the municipality, actually stepped in and said, we would like to offer ourselves as the place where you put your group of people, not the secretary, but the facilitator, we would like to actually welcome that person in. That was one person at that time to sit in our building, uh, and, and we will give them a, a place to sit, a cube computer to use, and then we would like to co-facilitate that this is revitalized and that we actually look at a mission and a vision together. So it was really, at that time, it was the public, a public entity that actually kind of revitalized it, suggested and offered the, I mean, the next step. Uh, and then people looked at each other and then they just realized, what did we just say? I mean, why did we even consider that first solution or option? That was not an option. They wanted to actually, but they needed somebody to take, take over and facilitate this in a critical time where they were so busy on actually trying to survive. Um, so that's what we need. At, in difficult times, I think uh, we need somebody to be, not only be the leader, but take the leadership. And uh, the more you are, the stronger you are, the more you share, the more it's likely that one will step up. Because in that, in that, that their position at that time, they, they have the extra X factor, so the power to X, right? Uh, so it's really the human factor that is also important here. So that's just one example of how, uh, I mean, if, I mean, people has to understand it and also has to show that they're actually willing to, to go the extra mile. And once they said yes, they had all the other ones aboard again. So, I mean, it wasn't a big, uh, 
a big investment. It was just saying it up out loud that this is something we want. If I, if I could add something, Commissioner yes. Ryan, on that question. Um, I remember something one of the municipal leaders said. It, I, I think it was the equivalent of a county, but I'm not really sure that it's the same unit of government. And he addressed what you asked, Mayor, about the role of government. He said one of the roles of government is to step back when things are going well and to step in when things are not. So I think that's an example that Pear just provided of, of the role that the city can play in moving this forward. Again, it's that supportive role when that's working and um, more assertive when, when it's not. So. I'd, like to, I'd like to also add something to that. Uh, when I said culture, it's more than just how you feel each day when you get up. The culture over there was not political when it came to things like climate change, right? If, if, if we depoliticize the idea that we need clean water and clean air, who can, from either side or any side, who could disagree we need clean water and clean air? It's absurd to think that someone say that I don't want that, right? But when it becomes political, then it's who you voted for in the last election and, and what you, you know, do on Friday evening. It was absolutely apolitical. It was a cultural thing that they said, we're going here. And when down times come, and when, when you dig deep in a, in a tough time, economically, companies begin to reduce their CapEx spending. They reduce all of their excess income. They didn't take their eye off that goal because culturally they were committed to it. It wasn't about politics or that short-term economic, right, that the disaster. That's what I witnessed, I guess, when I was there. Uh, just a little note to this. I think it's very important for us as facilitators and for the public organizations to step back once the companies are actually picking up on the idea, picking up on their one-to-one -one or one-to-many partnerships. That's when you kind of have to leave it like that and do not expect or demand, definitely not, to be part of that. Business should run as business normally would do, but they should do business together. And, and we don't need to know everything in the, I mean, in the public or the facilitating uh, sector of this. So we just want to facilitate until this point and not further, because then it just has to develop. I mean, what, what, what can develop, right? Based on, on, I mean, commercial terms also. Thank you so much. I would make one suggestion going forward. So the three of you are sitting together and some of you are sitting together. So have a seating chart where you mix yourself up a little bit going forward. Got it? All right, thanks. Well, thank, thank you, and I'm, I'm going to give Commissioner Rubio the last word, but first I, I want to acknowledge her leadership in bringing this conversation together today. I think this has really been fantastic. Portland is obviously doing a lot in this arena. None of us are doing enough, and Denmark inspires us to do better. And so we appreciate that you made the effort to come all this way to share this information with us, and it's landed very well. Thank you for being here. Commissioner Rubio. Thank you. And Commissioner Ryan, I just want to assure you that we are always together and mixed up. And we, we even had a dinner last night, which was a lot of fun seeing everybody again. So yes, we're very much used to being together. Um, but I appreciate the sentiment. Uh, I know where you're coming from. Um, so just in final thanks, I just want to, again, big, big appreciation to Meta, to Pear, and to Klaus for coming all this way to be with us. We're very honored uh, to, for you to be here in our, in our city um, and to share your expertise with us so that we can learn more about the symbiosis um, and how our businesses and our government can help in the just transition um, in the, to a carbon neutral future. Um, and to our local businesses, to our community groups, um, and to the bureau staff um, on behalf of the city, I just really wanna sincerely thank you for taking the risk to try something new um, and for your authentic partnerships in this work. Um, this, is, this is the real work, the partnership and the trust um, that we're gonna do. That is the foundation for everything we're going to need to do in, in, the, in the big work before us. So thank you for being here. And then finally, finally, I would be remiss if I did not acknowledge the tremendous work and lift of two incredible hardworking people, my chief of staff, Jillian Shoney, who was excellent, did a lot of behind the scenes work to make this happen, and Janet Hammer from BPS for doing all this work and continuing to do this work. So thank you to both of you. Thanks everyone. Great, and with that, we are adjourned. Thank you everybody for being here today. Recording stopped.